Um, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then I'll get right into my message this morning. Dear Lord, we thank you for the ability, the freedom we had to be here this morning. I thank you for the health of each and every one of us. I thank you that we're here in this place worshiping you. God, what we don't need is to hear from me, Charlie Parsons. What we do need is to hear from your word, and what we do need is to hear from your Holy Spirit. So God, I pray that your spirit would move, that we would hear something to grow closer to you, grow closer to your word. In your name we pray all this. Amen. Amen. And amen. And um, I don't believe that my message today is going to be very long, and um, that's, that's okay. If, you've, if, you've heard, if you're hearing me say that, you're probably thinking, well, Pastor Charlie, none of your messages are ever very long. <laughs> and um, to that, I say, you're welcome. Um, but today, <laughs> amen, there we go. <laughs> but today... I don't know. I mean, you never know. I, I could say it's not going to be long, and then the Holy Spirit could get moving, and I could be up here in an hour, and you guys would be kicking me off the stage. Amen? But with that being said, um, we'll get right into our word today. And my, my scripture today, my message today, my main passage comes from the book of Luke, um, the gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 15, verses 11, and I'm only going to go through 24. I'm not going to quite finish the story, but... The message, the scripture that we're reading is a very familiar one most of us have probably heard, and it is the, um, the parable of the prodigal son. You have all probably heard that, and um, I have been made aware that the TV is um, giving us a little bit of difficulty today, just the main TV here. I believe the side ones are working just fine, so, um, but it's no problem. If you, again, if you've heard me speak, you've heard me say you don't need the TV because most of you have your Bible memorized anyway, right? <laughs> You have it memorized. You don't even bring it to church because you're like, I got the whole thing right here. So the TVs are nice, but if the TV does go out today or does not come on, then I have full faith in you that you know exactly what's being read. Make sense? Yeah. Amen. Let's get right into it. So um, the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 24, I'm going to read that. And he said, this is Jesus speaking now, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a faraway country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything he had, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise, go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and I have sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants." And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming and felt compassion. He ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father then said, called to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and a shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and now he is found, and they began to celebrate. <clears throat> Amen? And that is where I pull my message from today, and the title of my message is, What Changed Me? What Changed Me is the title of my message today, and spoiler alert, what we're going to be talking about today is Jesus Christ. Amen? Yeah. We're going to be talking about Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And as we read through that story, I'm going to go through a little bit verse by verse of everything that we just read to kind of recap and get into what it is I want to get into today. Excuse me. And so as we look back in through the verse of the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son, that was Jesus speaking. Jesus told that story. And we get to verse 12, and the son asks his father for his inheritance, his property what was coming to him. And if you don't know, when he asked his father of this, he was implying to his father that he was ready for his father to be dead. If you don't know, when he asked, the, the, the property, the inheritance was going to be divided after the father had passed away down to the two sons. 
So when the son went to the father and said, Father, give me what's coming to me anyways. Give me my inheritance. I'm ready for it now. It was a great disrespect in this time, great, great disrespect to his father, essentially telling his father, you can go ahead and die now because I want what's coming to me. I have no more need for you here, here in this place. I just want my inheritance. I just want my money. I just want what's coming to me. I don't have need for you anymore. And that's what we find in verse 12 when the son goes to his father and, and he says these things. And, often, and you've heard the saying before, I'm sure, that sin costs us more than we are able to pay. Have y'all heard that saying? And in this story, we often, in this story, we're going to see in great detail how that statement is true. Amen. And he says to his father, give me everything. And his father was wealthy. And so he gives his son his inheritance. He gives him everything that he, was, that he had coming to him. He gives it to him, and the son goes after this disrespect to his father. And then we move on down to verse 16, and we, we find now. The son is out. He moved away. He wasted all of his money. He lost, he lost everything he had. He lost his clothes. He lost his money. He lost the identity of who he was. And he finds himself now begging, begging for anything better than what he was doing, begging for food, begging for companionship, begging for something. He had completely been degraded of who he was. And this is oftentimes where we find ourselves when we try to live without God. Can I get a, can I get a minute to talk about that? Amen. Thank you. And, and we often find ourselves like this when we move away from who God says that we are. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and um, if you've been in my youth group, which not many of you have, but oh, those of them up there have, if you've been in my youth group, you've heard me talk about to any extent, to any extent, who God created us to be, who God created us to be. I've talked about this for the last two weeks. They're probably tired of hearing about it, but I've talked about that, and I'm going to take a minute to talk about that now because when the, son, when the son talked to his father, he said, I no longer have need for you. I want my inheritance, and I'm leaving, and he rebelled against his father, and we often find ourselves in this same situation. When we find what God has for us, and then we look around and we see maybe I can figure out a better way on my own. And I say, God, I no longer have need for what you're, you think your plan is for my life. I'll figure it out myself. Right? And then we find ourselves hurt. We find ourselves stressed. We find ourselves depressed. We find ourselves broke. We find ourselves broke in. We find ourselves in these places because we chose to go a different way than what God has. We chose to say, I'll figure it out on my own. And being true to your natural self is being true to who the creator called you to be. Does that make sense? When God created you, he created you with intention. He created you with purpose. And so when you want to be true to who you are, you be true to the destiny and the, the influence that God created you to be for. Are y'all with me so far? So when you rebel, when you rebel against what God has for you and, and rebel against God's plan for your life, you're not only rebelling against who God is, you're rebelling against the person that God created you to be. You're ultimately rebelling against the true self that God said, this is who you can be. And you said, I don't even want to be that anymore. So now not only are you not your true self, you're some imposter of who you thought you were supposed to be. And the world says you can do it your own way and you can figure out who you're supposed to be. Whatever you want to do, just do it if it feels good. But God said, I created you to be here. So if you're not here, you're not just rebelling against me. You're not even who you were meant to be. You're not even who you were created to be anymore. And this is where the son finds himself when he's broke and busted and, and sick and hungry. This is where the son finds himself. And he realizes he needs a change. He needs a complete life change to get back to where his father was. And that's where we find ourselves. That's where humility comes in. I need a change. I need to do something to get back to where the father had me. Amen? And then we find out in verse 18, he comes to his senses. The Bible says he came to himself about his living situation and about the living situation back at his father's. He comes to his senses about where he finds himself. Excuse me, as I sip my water. I told you all, my throat's a little bit dry, so I sip my water all throughout this message. Hopefully that doesn't disturb you. But this is where the young man finds himself. I need a complete life change. And he comes to himself and he figures that out. And he figures, I'm going to go back. And then in verse 19, he rehearses what he's going to say. Let me read verse 19. <laughs> he rehearses what he's going to say. He says, I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to say this as soon as I find it. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. 
He rehearsed it. He said, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as a servant. I don't even want to be your son anymore. I'm not worthy. And he goes to his father and he says, I'm going to say that. And then we get to verse 20, and his father sees him a long way off. And we've heard before that the reason his father sees him is because the father was anxiously, earnestly waiting for his son's return. All along hoping for his son to return, watching, saying, one day I'll see my son return to me. Amen. And his father sees him, and he's coming back. And he sees him, and he runs to his son. And the Bible says he embraces him, he kisses him, he hugs him. He tells him how much he loves him. And he says, and the son begins to say what he rehearsed in verse 19. The son begins to, to say what he thought he was supposed to say. The son begins to say, <clears throat> I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And before he can get to the part about treat me as a hired servant, the father interrupts him. The father doesn't even give him the opportunity to degrade himself anymore. The father doesn't even give him the opportunity to mislabel himself anymore. Because... Because he wanted to mislabel himself and say, treat me as a hired servant. He said, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as a hired servant. Right? That's what he said. And he gets to the father, and the father gives him a hug, and the father gives him a kiss, and the father gives him a robe. And he says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat. And the father stops him. He says, Whoa, wait, wait a minute. And he interrupts him. And he says, get the fatted calf. Get the robe. My son is returned. Are you all with me? And he says these things because God will never take a hired servant out of a son. Are you with me? If you're a child of God, he will never turn you into a slave. Are y'all with me? That's what he said when his son came back. Because the son was ready to be a slave and ready to mislabel himself because of where he found himself broken, hurting, disturbed. That's where the son was. But God said, that's not where I put you. And when the father interrupted his son, before he could even say that, he's metaphorically saying to the son, don't forget who you are. Are y'all with me today? God's saying to his children, don't forget who you are. You might have been hurt, and you might have been broke, and you might have been busted, and you might have been hungry, but don't forget who I said you are. Amen? Don't forget that. Church, this is our story. Jesus told this parable. This was Jesus speaking, and he told this parable of this family. And it is representative of who we are to God the Father. Amen? Because the father represents God, represents Jesus Christ. The son, the rebellious son, represents us. Are you all with me? And so, so when, 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 when the son talks about, give me my inheritance, I'm leaving, I don't need you anymore, this is representative of when we choose to no longer live for Christ. When we choose to say, whether you, you decide you don't believe, or whether you decide you don't care, or whatever the case may be, this is is who we are when we say, God, I don't, I don't care what you've done for me. God, I don't care that your son died on a cross. God, I don't care that he rose from the dead. I, I either don't care or I don't believe or whatever the situation is. That has no effect on me anymore. I'm going to figure out my own way and, and you can deal with it because I'm going to do it myself. And that's exactly what the son said to his father in the story. And that's what we say to God when we don't care about what he's done for us. Amen? And we find ourselves there. And the change that required, we, we talk about the change in the story, the change in, in the son, it comes through Jesus Christ. Amen? It doesn't come through my human ability. It doesn't come through how I live. It doesn't come through my moral. It doesn't come through my willpower. Are you with me? We have to go to the one who changed us. What changed me? Jesus. What changed you? Jesus. We oftentimes, we look at other people who don't live for live for God, and we say, well, if you just stop sinning, life would be better for you. And that's true to a point because Jesus Christ demands change from our sinful ways, right? Amen. Except how can I stop sinning without Jesus? I can't. How can I change my life without the influence of Jesus? I can't. So if you just stop sinning, well, I tried. I tried that. It's hard. I tried to break my addiction. I couldn't. I tried to be happy. I couldn't. I tried to forgive people. I couldn't. I tried to make better money. I couldn't. I tried to do this. You're talking like it's real easy. I tried. And guess what? It didn't work. I'm still bitter. I'm still broke. I still hate people. I still don't forgive people. I still have that addiction. 
I still do drugs. I still do this. I tried to change. You said change your life, and I tried, and guess what? It didn't work, okay? It's hard. Life is hard, and Christians want to tell me, just, just stop sinning, and God will bless you. Well, I tried. didn't work. I can't do it on my own. How dare I tell somebody stop sinning and then not tell them the solution to what their stop sinning is? I can't tell you to stop sinning and leave out Jesus because without him, it's impossible. Are y'all with me? It requires a change when you come to know Jesus, but I can't change you. You can't change on your own. Y'all heard the saying, you know, the world will never give you more than you can handle, or Christians say God will never give you more than you can handle. But guess what? Our humanity is sinful. The world is sinful. So without Jesus Christ in your life, the world and your humanity will give you more than you can handle. That might not be good news, but it's true. Somebody might die. You might get sick. You might have an addiction. Your family might be broken. The world might hand you something that's a little bit more than you can handle. Y'all ever been through anything? But when the world gives me something more than I can handle, I don't take it on my own anymore because I've been forgiven by Jesus Christ and I live for Him now. And when I give it to Him... I no longer bear that burden on my shoulders by myself anymore. I needed to break that addiction, and I didn't go through it by myself. I gave it to God, and he helped me. I needed forgiveness in my heart, and I didn't do it by myself. I gave it for God, and he helped me. Amen. I needed my loved ones to get saved, but I didn't save them living right. I told them about Jesus, and he saved them when he went to the cross. Can I get an amen? Spill this water. It's not what I've done. It's not what I've done. It's not how perfect I can live because without Jesus Christ, I can't even live it right myself. But I give it to him. I give it to Jesus because Jesus changed my life and he's ready and he's willing to change yours as well. Amen? I can't do it on my own. Jesus Christ preached the gospel of the kingdom his whole life. Amen? In Matthew chapter 4, verses 23, if I can find it real quick, just real short. This is Jesus. And he says, and the Bible says, he went through all of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and the temples, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Why did he do that? Because he knew that you are an eternal soul that has an eternity somewhere. And it is in the kingdom of God for those that have a relationship with him. And he taught the kingdom, he taught eternity. I don't know if you know this or not, but you're not just a body occupying space on this earth for a short time. You are an eternal soul that lives in this body for a short time. But after this body is done and worn out, we move on to an eternity. And Jesus taught the kingdom. There's importance in the kingdom. There's importance in your eternal soul. And that's what Jesus taught, and that's why people loved him. Let me tell you something about Jesus Christ for a second. Roman historian, not preacher, not teacher, not great Christian man, Roman historian. His name was Flavius Joseph. He stated in two separate recordings, History of the Jewish People and his Testimonium, quote, Jesus Christ was a man who lived, performed miracles, did the things that he said he would do, end quote. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, there is proven history that Jesus Christ lived on this earth and did the things he said he would do. You can trust your Bible. You can trust who God says he is. If God made a promise to you, you can trust it. If your Bible says something, you can trust it. Amen? We, we need Jesus. I can't go through it on my own. I can't break something on my own. I have to give it to God and go through it with him. I'm not strong enough to do this life thing by myself. I need Jesus. Amen? And as the church, as the church, there has to be less focus on my imperfections, less focus on my failures, less focus on the sin in me, and more focus on the one who is perfect, 
more focused on the one who is without sin, more focused on the one who changed me from my sinful lifestyle to the lifestyle that I live now, more focused on Jesus Christ who has the ability to change and save your soul. Amen? Don't mishear me as the church, as we grow and as we mature. Paul did it. He calls out sin. We don't allow each other to live in sin. Don't mishear me that Jesus will, will save you and then you do anything you want. As I, you've heard me say a hundred times already, Jesus will save your soul and change you. He loves you too much to leave you the way he found you. So he won't. Amen? So we come to Jesus and the change. A lot of people hear change and they're like, I don't like that word. I'm not changing. I'm being who I want to be. Change. That's ridiculous. Why would, Christian, why would I be a Christian if it demands change? Jesus Christ demands change away from a sinful nature. But the reward for that is far better than the life you lived before. I promise you. Amen? People talk about, I don't want to change. But Jesus said, I created you to be this way. And in order for you to be this way, you have to come through me. And then when you come through me, I demand change away from addiction, away from sinful lifestyle. I demand change. Amen? That's what Jesus Christ desires, and we need focus on who Jesus is. We can't promote the church, and we can't promote change, and we can't promote salvation without Jesus. Amen? Without what he did for us, without how he lived, without reading his word, God has done everything for us, church. Everything. God has done everything for us. There is no metaphor sufficient that I could use to describe everything that Jesus Christ has done for you and done for me. He went to the cross and he took your sin with him. He took hell with him. Are you all with me? There's nothing I can say to pretty up what Jesus done. It's insufficient. He's already done it. Even as we cursed God to live our lives better off without him, he eagerly awaited for our return to him. He welcomes us home into open arms and to change our lives. He completely refuses to call us anything but loved and accepted, even when we didn't deserve it, church. Are you with me? In verse 20 and 21, the son runs home to his father, and the father embraces him, and he hugs him, and he kisses him, and the son wanted to mislabel himself, but the, but the, the father said, you're not a hired servant. You're a child of God, and I love you. Can't you see his grace? Can't you see what God has done for you, church? When I wanted to mislabel myself, as unworthy. God said, you're worthy. When I wanted to mislabel myself as unlovable, God said, I sent my son for you because I love you so much. When I wanted to do that, God called me loved. His grace is sufficient. Amen? I can't explain what God has done for me. Open arms. I lived in rebellion like the son. And then when I was ready to come back to God, he didn't put me through the ringer. He opened his arms. He gave me a hug. He gave me a kiss. He said, I love you. He said, I forgive you. Are you with me? That's what changed me. And that's what changed you. Amen. Freely I have been forgiven and freely I have been loved. So freely I will give. Amen. More of who Jesus is. That's the goal. I can't save you. I can live right, and I can be an example, but if you don't have that relationship with Jesus, if you don't have that encounter with Jesus, it does you no good. Amen? Amen, church?